I am Dr. Rapp, and this is Appreciating Shakespeare, Series 2, Podcast T, Henry V. Henry V, the last play in Shakespeare's second tetralogy, was briefly mentioned in Session 2 of Chapter 10 in Series 1 as falling into the category of pageant. That is because the play is built of a succession of scenes whose through line is simply the triumphant kingship of Henry V, ending with his successful conquest of France and marriage to Catherine, daughter of the French king Charles VI. The pageant quality of the play is reinforced by the introduction of each act by a chorus, exhorting us to use our imaginations and filling in the gaps in the unfolding story. In the first of the choral speeches, called Prologue, Shakespeare gives both a description and an example of the playwright's method of bringing his story to life through words, the central medium of Shakespearean drama. Think when we talk of horses that you see them printing their proud hoofs in the receiving earth. Prologue, lines 26 to 27. And we do. So irresistible is Shakespeare's art. For example, the alliteration on the two plosive P's and the trochee on printing, leading to the spondy on proud hoofs, are the force that lands on the softness of the four unstressed syllables of in the receiving and the non-plosive sound of earth, just as the hoofs of the horses print themselves into the earth in the image. A subtle, and compelling use of the figure of speech called onomatopoeia. The invitation sets us up to piece out the entire pageant with our thoughts. Prologue, line 23. But as always with Shakespeare, no category can hold him in. In addition to being a pageant, Henry V is also a penetrating dramatization of what makes for excellence in a good king. In Henry, Shakespeare's ideal king, we find virtue, justice, self-knowledge, wit, the power to inspire his followers, and humility before God. In the subplot scenes, we have the report of the last-minute repentance and the death of Falstaff, ending the era of Henry's youth, whose dissoluteness in the Shakespeare plays, as opposed to the historical chronicles, was always an illusion. We also have the interactions of representatives of the four peoples that make up what would later become the United Kingdom. Gower, the Englishman, Fluellen, the Welshman, MacMorris, the Irishman, and Jamie, the Scotsman. Wales was united to England by law in 1535 and 1542. Under King James I, England, Scotland, and Ireland were united in 1603. Among these groups, there is some friction, but they are united in loyalty to Henry and in brave fighting for him in the wars against the French, proving the validity of the advice of Henry's dying father in Act 4, Scene 5, Lines 213 to 214 of Henry IV, Part 2. Be it thy course to busy, giddy minds with foreign quarrels, that action, hence borne out, may waste the memory of the former days. That memory being of Henry IV's coming to the throne by deposing Richard II and the consequent rebellions against him. With that overview in mind, let's look at some of the key scenes in the play. After the stirring prologue, the play begins by giving us a picture of the court gossip and intrigue that invariably surrounds a king. Here the Archbishop of Canterbury and the Bishop of Ely share with us high praise of the virtuous transformation of the wild Prince Hal into the virtuous King Henry V, realizing, as they say in Act 1, Scene 1, Line 63-64, to that the prince had intentionally obscured his contemplation under the veil of wildness. That conversation is bracketed by their concerns over a bill that would strip the church of half its property, 
a bill they try to counteract by offering to donate a vast sum of money from the church to fund the king's intended war in France. In the next scene, Act 1, Scene 2, the archbishop engages in a long discourse on European royal history to justify Henry's right to the throne of France. I will return to this argument in a few moments in specific note 1. Satisfied that he is indeed justified, the king admits the French ambassador who delivers from the dauphin, literally dolphin, the name for the French heir apparent to the throne, the mocking gift of tennis balls. Henry responds at lines 259 to 263. We are glad the dolphin is so pleasant with us. When we have matched our rackets to these balls, we will in France, by God's grace, play a set shall strike his father's crown into the hazard. And we are reminded again that Henry's earlier wildness was a ruse. We understand him well, how he comes o'er us, meaning taunts or scoffs at us, with our wilder days, not measuring what use we made of them. Lines 266 to 268. This scene has settled Henry's determination to unite England and its allies in a legitimate war to recover the former English dominions in France. Before Henry can lead his forces to France, however, he must deal with a secret plot against his life in England. In Act 2, Scene 2, the traitors, Lord Scroop, the Earl of Cambridge, and Sir Thomas Grey, advise Henry not to forgive a drunken man for railing against him. Henry forgives the man against their advice, and then, handing the three their own indictments for treason, says, The mercy that was quick in us but late, by your own counsel, is suppressed and killed. Line 79 to 80. After a powerful speech about how deeply surprising and hurtful the treachery of these three men has been, he sends them to be executed as they deserve, praying that God acquit them of their practices, meaning their plots, line 144. That is, may God forgive them. The scene is important in revealing both that Henry will not tolerate the kind of rebellions that his father had to war against all his reign, and that Henry, in his judgments, tempers justice with mercy. He is merciful when real danger to the state is not involved, but meets out justice when dangerous treachery is involved. And he distinguishes between his own responsibility for earthly justice, enacted upon the subject's lives, and God's responsibility for heavenly justice upon their souls. This theme will return on the night before the Battle of Agincourt. In Act 2, Scene 3, we have the description by Hostess Quickly, now married to Pistol, of the death of Falstaff. Her ignorance is funny. She calls Abraham's bosom Arthur's bosom in lines 9 to 10. But from her speech we gather that Falstaff has gone to his maker in a state of penitence. for a babbled of green fields, and a cried out, God, 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 three or four times, lines 17 to 19. The green fields are probably the green pastures of Psalm 23, verse 2. If so, Falstaff, experiencing himself to be in the valley of the shadow of death, must be trying to recite that psalm in a deathbed repentance. I'll return to this line in a few moments in specific note, too. In any case, that Falstaff calls out on God tells us what we are meant to know. It is both funny and painfully ironic that the hostess bid him a should not think of God. I hope there was no need to trouble himself with any such thoughts yet, lines 20 to 22 when such thoughts are precisely what he ought to be thinking at the last possible time for him to think them. In Act 2, Scene 4, the French court is depicted with its weak king and its proud and overconfident lords. 
the French court is thus depicted as ripe for defeat by the brave and virtuous Henry, followed by a united England. That English unity is depicted in the scenes with Flewellyn, Gower, MacMorris, and Jamie, when the proprieties and improprieties of behaviour in battle are debated. Through his Welsh pronunciation of the English language, Flewellyn is revealed as a noble-minded, true liegeman to the king. His own subordinate form of justice, mirroring the king's, is played out in Act 5, Scene 1, in the matter of the leak, against the rascally scald, meaning scurvy, scabby, beggarly, lousy, pragging, that is bragging, knave, pistol, lines 5 to 6. The braggart soldier, representing the depraved cronies of Hal's past, is put in his place by the upright and principled comrades of Henry's mature kingship. The depravities of the French aristocracy, before and during battle, are contrasted with Henry's two great speeches before the walls of Harfleur in Act Three, which show him to be both an inspiring leader in battle, once more unto the breach, dear friends, Act Three, Scene One, Lines One to Thirty Four, and a master of peacemaking, how yet resolves the governor of the town, Act Three, Scene Three, Lines One to Forty Three. The latter speech is unfortunately and erroneously used to justify the critique of Henry as a bloodthirsty warmonger. This utterly misreads the point of the speech. As Philip Thompson writes, Our film critics are very happy that Kenneth Branagh's Henry V film of 1989 restores the speech of Harfleur, which Olivier had deleted in his film of 1944. This is because it reveals a different Henry, whose many sides include one that is capable of the utmost brutality. As in the case of Prince John's despised deception in Henry IV Part II, the event, meaning the outcome, does not enter into their response. Harfleur is threatened with the utmost brutality in order that none will occur, and none does. Henry orders mercy for all. The critics confuse the power of oratory to horrify men out of war with a lust for the action described in order to prevent it. They speak as though the massacre had happened and added a dark aspect to Henry's character. There is no dark aspect to Henry's character, and the Branna film is utterly misleading in giving us a Henry V of blood and mud and nasty realpolitik. Branna even has Henry hard-heartedly standing by to watch as his former crony Bardolph is hanged. In Shakespeare's play, Flewellyn reports at Act 3, Scene 6, lines 100 to 101, that Bardolph, serving under the Duke of Exeter, is like, meaning likely, to be executed for robbing a church. Flewellyn adds, his nose is executed and his fire's out, lines 105 to 106 implying either that in custody he is cut off from the alcohol that turns his nose and face red, or that he has indeed been literally executed. But if that execution takes place at all, it is off stage and is not directly of Henry's doing, except in so far as Henry has forbidden his army to engage in theft in France. Henry's comment on hearing this report at lines 107 to 113 is, We would have all such offenders so cut off, and we give express charge that in our marches through the country there be nothing compelled from the villages, nothing taken but paid for, none of the French upbraided or abused in disdainful language, for when lenity and cruelty play for a kingdom, the gentler gamester is the soonest winner. There can be no good reason for thinking that Henry should be sentimentally sorrowful over the death of Bardolph, who in life had many opportunities and good cause to change his drunken, thieving ways, and has not done so. Where kingdoms are at stake, it would be foolish to spend time on sorrowing for the likes of Bardolph, whose punishment, like that of the traitors in Act Two, Scene Two, is just. 
Henry's supposed friendship with Falstaff, Bardolph, and the others was never truly friendship, and our attachment to the jollities of the comic scenes in the Henry IV plays ought not to evoke more compassion for the banishment of Falstaff or the execution of Bardolph than admiration for the seriously responsible king, who is nothing like the imaginary cold-hearted politician that modern critics invent and that Branagh portrays against Shakespeare's obvious intention. Another supposed excuse for portraying a dark aspect to Henry is his order to kill the French prisoners. But again, this decision is a punishment for the depravity of the French. The French, during the battle at Agincourt, have circled behind the English and attacked their boy servants and supplies. As Fluellen fumes at Act 4, Scene 7, Lines 1 to 4, kill the poise and the luggage, that is, kill the boys and the luggage, in Fluellen's Welsh pronunciation, tis expressly against the law of arms. Tis as errant a piece of knavery, mark you now, as can be offered. In your conscience now, is it not? In response to this French outrage, Henry says, at lines 55 to 56, I was not angry since I came to France until this instant, and gives order that all French prisoners be killed without mercy. Once again, we are to remember that he is not damning their souls, but trying to win a battle against injustice. Guilt for the death of the French prisoners is on the heads of the French lords, and the disposition of prisoners' souls by God, as we will see, is on their own heads. The contrast to the French is further developed in the scenes portraying the eve of the Battle of Agincourt. In the French tense, the lords are nervously awaiting the dawn. The dauphin is bragging about his horse, and the others are variously backbiting, Act 3, Scene 7, and Act 4, Scene 2. At the same time, in the English camp, we get first the comical moral uplift of Fluellen, at Act 4, Scene 1, Lines 66 to 80. It is the greatest admiration in the universal world when the true and ancient prerogatives and laws of the wars is not kept. If the enemy is an ass and a fool and a prating coxcomb, is it meet, think you, that we should also, look you, be an ass and a fool and a prating coxcomb in your own conscience now? And then a great philosophical conversation takes place. About King Henry, the chorus to Act Four tells us, Forth he goes and visits all his host, bids them good morrow with a modest smile, and calls them brothers, friends, and countrymen, that every wretch, pining and pale before, beholding him, plucks comfort from his looks. A largesse universal, like the sun, his liberal eye doth give to every one, thawing cold fear that mean and gentle all behold, as may unworthiness define, a little touch of Harry in the night. Lines 32 to 47. Mean means of the lower classes, and gentle means of the gentility, the upper classes. Henry then disguises himself, and in Act 4, Scene 1, brings that little touch to three typical English soldiers. When the disguised king claims that the king's cause is just and his quarrel honorable, lines 127 to 128, Williams replies, that's more than we know. Bates then asserts that, we know enough if we know we are the king's subjects. If the king's cause be wrong, our obedience to the king wipes the crime of it out of us, lines 131 to 133. But in the next lines, Williams fears that, if the cause be not good, the king himself hath a heavy reckoning to make. If these men do not die well, it will be a black matter for the king that led them to it. To this, Henry replies in a long prose speech that offers two analogies to the king-subject relation, father-son and master-servant. 
His point is that the king is not bound to answer the particular endings of his soldiers, the father of his son, nor the master of his servant. For they purpose not their death when they purpose their services. Every subject's duty is the king's, but every subject's soul is his own. Lines 155 to 177. Henry's argument satisfies the soldiers, but Williams's initial concern evokes from Henry the great verse soliloquy on ceremony, which compares the sound sleep of the subject to the uneasy watchfulness of a king, echoing his father's speech that ended, Uneasy lies the head that wears a crown, in Henry IV, Part Two at Act 3, Scene 1, lines 4 to 31. Here, Henry says, The slave, a member of the country's peace, enjoys it, but in gross brain little watts, meaning is little aware, what watch, meaning wakefulness and guarding, the king keeps to maintain the peace, whose hours the peasant best advantages. Lines 281 to 284. Then Henry prays, Not today, O Lord, O not today, think not upon the fault my father made in compassing the crown. Lines 292 to 294. And he lists the forms of penance he has done for the soul of Richard II. The next morning he gives his inspiring and justly famous speech to his minuscule army, encouraging them to bravery despite the overwhelming odds against them. He does so by inviting them, in Act 4, Scene 3, to imagine looking back on this St. Crispin's Day, October 25th, the feast of the Christian brother saints Crispinus and Crispianus, martyred in 287 A.D., from the vantage point of having won the battle. And Crispin Crispian shall ne'er go by from this day to the ending of the world, but we in it shall be remembered. We few, we happy few, we band of brothers. For he today that sheds his blood with me shall be my brother, be he ne'er so vile, this day shall gentle his condition, that is, raise his rank to that of gentlemen. And gentlemen in England now abed shall think themselves accursed they were not here, and hold their manhoods cheap, while any speaks that fought with us upon St. Crispin's Day. Lines 57 to 67. In the phrase with us, Henry entirely unites himself with his army. The word us refers both to himself, in the royal plural, and to the band of brothers. And then the miraculous happens. King Henry's forces defeat the French. It is one of the striking qualities about this play that at crucial moments Henry exhibits an intense and repeated reverence before God. When in Act 4, Scene 8, he reads the list of the French dead and the English dead, four men of name, meaning of higher rank, and only twenty-five others, he says, O oh God, thy arm was here and not to us, but to thy arm alone, ascribe we all, lines 106 to 108, alluding to the non nobis of Psalm 115, verse 1, not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto thy name give glory, which a few lines down he will order recited along with the hymn Te Deum, we praise thee, O God. I'll give further examples of Henry's reverence as key lines in a moment. In Act V, through the formal and ceremonious agency of the Duke of Burgundy, Henry comes to terms with the French king, is named the heir to his throne, and marries Catherine, the French king's daughter, after some wooing in his broken French and her broken English. When he tries to kiss her and she objects, Henry translates, it is not the fashion for the maids in France to kiss before they are married, would she say? Act 5, C2, lines 265 to 266. Then he replies, O oh, Kate, nice customs curtsy to great kings. Dear Kate, 
You and I cannot be confined within the weak list of a country's fashion. We are the makers of manners, Kate. Lines 268 to 271. The final chorus mentions the glory of this star of England, Henry V, and tells us that of England and France he left his son imperial lord, Henry VI, in infant bands crowned king of France and England, did this king succeed? Lines 8 to 10. However, so many had the managing of his state that they lost France and made his England bleed, which oft our stage hath shown. Lines 12 to 13. That is, in the first tetralogy, the three Henry VI plays and Richard III. The play as a whole makes use of the patriotism of Shakespeare's audience, its anti-French disposition and fear of internal civil strife, to inspire unity under the monarch. At the same time, it challenges every succeeding monarch to rise to the standard of justice and empathy for his subjects that Henry sets. England would not find a comparably heroic leader until the days of Winston Churchill, when the Battle of Britain was survived and World War II won, partly because the words of this play lived in the minds and hearts of Shakespeare's 20th century audience. Now here is one group of key lines. These are further examples of Henry's expression of awareness of and reverence for God. From Act 1, Scene 2, we charge you in the name of God, take heed, line 23. But this lies all within the will of God, line 289. For God before we'll chide this dolphin at his father's door, lines 307 to 308. From Act 2, Scene 2, God quit you in his mercy, line 166. Let us deliver our puissance into the hand of God, lines 189 to 190. From Act 4, Scene 1, O God of battles, steal my soldiers' hearts, line 289. From Act 4, Scene 3, And how thou pleasest, God, dispose the day, line 133. From Act 4, Scene 7, Praise be God and not our strength for it, line 87. From Act 4, Scene 8, Take it, God, for it is none but thine, lines 111 to 112. And be it death proclaimed through our host to boast of this, or take that praise from God which is his only. Lines 114 to 160. Yes, Captain, but with this acknowledgement that God fought for us. Lines 119 to 120. Now here are four specific notes to help you in your reading. Note 1. In the argument in favor of the war in Act 1, Scene 2, lines 38 to 39, the Archbishop quotes the phrase, In terram salicam mulieris ne succedant. No woman shall succeed in salic land. His discourse recounts the European royal history to refute the French claim that Henry has no right to the French throne because of the law salic, loi salique according to which females in Salic lands cannot inherit. The French claim the Salic lands to be in France. The Archbishop claims them to be in Germany. The issue matters because Henry claims France through his great-grandmother, Isabella of France, wife of Edward III, and sister to Charles IV of France. When Charles died in 1328, Edward claimed the French throne as Charles's nephew, and his nearest adult male relative, and renewed the claim in 1340 when the French appropriated Edward's lands in Aquitaine. That exchange initiated the Hundred Years' War. Note 2. In Act 2, Scene 3, Line 17, the hostess, formerly Mistress Quickly, says of Falstaff that a babbled of green fields. This is an emendation. The first folio text reads, A Table of Green Fields. It was the editor Tybalt who amended the folio's word to a babbled, a reading justified by script analysis and followed by almost all editors. 
even if table was the intended word, the line may still refer to the same psalm. See Psalm 23, verse 5. Note 3. In Act 3, Scene 4, the French princess, destined to become Henry's queen, is trying to learn English, beginning with the names of the parts of the body. Some of those words, as pronounced by Alice, her waiting gentlewoman, sound immodest. Non pour les dames d'honneur d'usé, not for honorable women to use, line 54. Specifically, at line 51, the English word foot, F-O-O-T, sounds to Catherine like the French word F-O-U-T-R-E. And Alice pronounces the English word gown, G-O-W-N, as the French word C-O-U-N. You may find their English equivalents in an unexpurgated French dictionary. Note 4. At Act 4, Scene 1, Line 93, Henry equivocates with the phrase under Sir Thomas Erpingham. Henry implies that he is a soldier serving under the command of Sir Thomas Erpingham, but he is not lying, because in fact he is at the moment sitting under the cloak belonging to Sir Thomas, which he had borrowed back at line 24. I am Dr. Rapp, and this is Appreciating Shakespeare.